Good afternoon and welcome to Society of Wetland Scientists August webinar. My name is Roy Massaros and I'm a member of the SWS webinar committee. I'm going to be your moderator today. The general format for today's webinar will be a 45 minute presentation by our speakers, which will be followed by approximately 15 minutes for questions and announcements. We are proud to announce that this webinar has been pre-approved by the SWS Professional Certification Program and is applicable for 0 0.06 continuing education credits that can be applied to your professional wetland scientist or your wetland professional and training certifications. As a reminder, participation certificates are available upon request. Please contact SWS staff if interested. Certificates are also available for those who watch webinar recordings. All webinars are recorded and archived for complimentary viewing by members of our past webinars page. The presentation today is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording following the webinar. Before we get started, let me take a moment to familiarize you with the GoToWebinar system. On the right side of your screen, there is a control panel that looks like the example on this slide. In the audio pane, you can adjust the webinar audio by using your telephone or computer speakers. At any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the questions pane. Our presenter will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. If you would like a copy of today's slides, please find a copy, a PDF copy, in the handouts pane of the control panel. We also ask that you take a moment to complete the evaluation survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. In addition, we encourage you to use the hashtag SWSWebinar on Twitter to tweet about today's webinar. Now let's test the questions pane and at the same time get some demographics by having everyone type in the state or country you are participating from. With the logistics out of the way, let's get started with our webinar. It is my pleasure to welcome today's presenters, Gary Irvin and Corey Shoemaker from the Department of Biological Sciences at the Mississippi State University. Gary Irvin received his bachelor's degree in 1996 and a PhD in 2000 in biological sciences from the University of Alabama. During his doctoral studies, he worked in the area of wetland plant ecology, publishing several studies on the rush species Jankus effusus. Following receipt of his PhD, Urban held a postdoctoral research position in the Department of Entomology at the University of Kansas, where he studied plant defense response, responses to insect herbivores. He began his faculty position in Mississippi State University in 2001. Research in Urban's lab currently includes work in the area of wetlands, vegetation management, and basic plant ecology. Corey Shoemaker was awarded a BS in 2010 in biology and French from Wittenberg University, master's in 2013 in wildlife and fishery science, and has recently defended his PhD dissertation in biological sciences at Mississippi State University. As a doctoral student, he examined factors driving wetland plant assemblage development and restored wetlands. Outside of his dissertation, he's collected and produced a statewide survey of aquatic plant distribution and abundance across Mississippi water bodies and examined novel approaches to managing biochemical processes and agricultural drainage ditches. Please mark your calendar for our next SWS webinar, which will be held on September 20th. This will be our free quarterly webinar, and we hope that you'll invite your entire network of researchers and practitioners to join us. We hope to see you there. Also, we currently have two student SWS wetland ambassadors, Tatiana from Mexico and Aurora from India working with their mentors in U.S. and Canada. These students are supported by a grant from SWS, and we started our very first crowdfunding campaign in May through Crowd Rise, Crowd Rise to provide funds for our incredible wetland ambassadors. So please consider donating any amounts. Our goal is 2000 on your campaign page, which you can link to the SWS web page under the awards and grants drop down menu. Also, I understand that both of our 2018 wetland ambassadors will be presenting their work at an upcoming SWS webinar. So stay tuned for that announcement in the next couple of months. I want to thank Gary and Corey for taking time out of their busy schedules and to uh, the attendees today for your time. Thank you.
we're we're currently switching over control. Okay. And uh, I lost my screen. This is Gary. Hello. Um, Hi, Gary. I I see your screen. Do you not see it on your machine anymore? I don't actually. Um, so Good thing we have Tony on the line to help us. Stand by here. I'm fixing it. Okay. Thank you. I'll just well maybe I won't. I was going to go ahead and get started, but I can tell people why why we're here today, uh, and thank Roy for the introduction. I appreciate that. Um, I see the screen's coming back up, but um, you've all, everybody, I think, has seen the title. Um, so we're interested in interactions between um, vegetation, well, and vegetation, and water quality. And I think maybe I have the screen here. Um, okay, I don't have control of it yet, but. The, um, of course, the re the, one of the reasons that we were interested in doing this work is the, the coming need to improve the, the pra agricultural practices to make them more sustainable, um, largely because of the increase in human population that we anticipate over the next couple of decades, where some projections are we'll hit 9 billion people on the planet uh, by about the, the middle of the century. And of course, all of these people are gonna be hungry at various points in time. And um, one of the major contributors to uh, eutrophication um, in natural systems, and I think I do have control of it now, thanks guys. Um, <clears throat> one of the major contributors, uh, but not the sole contributor, is uh, agriculture. And as we try to ramp up in certain parts of the world, production in agriculture and increase the intensification, there's an expectation that uh, we're going to run into issues of further eutrophication of natural systems. So the, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, um, among other people, has studied this problem and they've made um, uh, a few recommendations of areas in which we need to focus efforts to try and minimize impacts, negative impacts of agricultural and natural systems. For example, improving the efficiency in the use of natural resources, um, such as water for irrigation, um, improving the practices to, to uh, increase the sustainability with which we can do things like irrigate uh, farmlands while we add maybe additional fertilizer, which could run off into nearby water bodies. And so all of these are some, some impacts that we run into. And if we look globally, um, in, in particular in the more uh, heavily populated portion areas of the globe. Um, we can see here in this map that was produced by Diaz and Rosenberg in 2008, there are lots of areas uh, indicated by the, the small white dots around the coastlines that are experiencing eutrophication. Um, here in the United States, uh, in the southeastern U.S., we have uh, the northern Gulf of Mexico region, which you can see is pretty densely populated by areas of hypoxia. And everyone who's familiar with this issue is aware that the Mississippi River Basin is a major contributor of uh, nutrients and other materials that contribute to, to this hypoxia. Uh, and of course, the, the dead zone that we experience um, pretty regularly within the, the northern region of the Gulf. Uh, within the Mississippi River Basin, we have a uh, considerable area that's under row crop production. Uh, in this particular map, the areas that are pink are cultivated crops. The areas that are yellow are areas of grasslands or pastures, which um, may be used for grazing livestock. And so uh, in, in portions, especially in the western portion of the Mississippi Basin, we have a lot of nutrient and organic matter inputs from resulting from agriculture. Uh, in other parts of the basin, people have actually shown that uh, urban activities may be a greater contributor, but certainly in the western portion, agriculture is a, a heavy contributor of uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as organic matter and sediment into the Mississippi River system. And all of these materials ultimately find their way to the mouth of the Mississippi and the Atchafalaya River, uh, rivers in the northern Gulf of Mexico and produce this annual zone of, of hypoxia, the Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone, which uh, trends uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 12 to 15,000 square kilometers. 
Um, for those of you who are familiar with U.S. geography, this is somewhere in the neighborhood of the size of the state of Connecticut. Um, if you're from other parts, it's about a tenth the size of states like Mississippi, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, and you can see on the, this figure, there's this task force goal of about 5,000 square kilometers, which um, looks like we hit that once out of the last 25 years or so. Um, so th this is a major issue. A lot of people are interested in, in um, developing methods, practices whereby we can reduce these impacts and potentially at some point hit maybe this 5,000 square kilometer target that, that seems to continue to elude us. Um, some of the practices that are uh, con under consideration for helping mitigate these nutrient inputs are uh, farm scale management practices to conserve nutrients, to retain sediments on, uh, on site in farms, and a number of these have been put into place. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service has spent uh, two to three hundred million dollars over the last decade or so to uh, toward implementing, developing and implementing some of these practices throughout the Mississippi River Basin. And, uh, and this is where our research uh, comes in, intersects with this issue of eutrophication within, um, within the Mississippi River Basin, Gulf of Mexico region, uh, because the, the work that we're going to talk to you about was conducted primarily on uh, USDA Wetland Reserve Program, or WRP, wetland site. This program um, was one that was a partnership between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and private landowners, whereby uh, marginal farmland was set aside in conservation easements directed specifically for either the restoration or creation of wetland habitat uh, throughout the United States. In Mississippi, uh, we've had over 63,000 hectares in, enrolled in this program, uh, which is something like 630 square kilometers. So about 5% the area of that hypoxic zone, uh, for those of you who are you know, trying to keep track of all these, these uh, geographic comparisons. Um, so we've had about 63 hectares enrolled in Mississippi, and uh, Corey and I were interested in looking at these systems to determine um, at what level they're functioning and, and providing various types of wetland services, such as water quality improvements, um, providing ve wetland uh, vegetation that's characteristic of wetlands, and and the degree to which the, these restored systems might compare to non-managed wetlands within, um, within the, an agricultural landscape. And so we were working uh, in the maroon area, the, actually the northern portion of the maroon area in, in this map here, the state of Mississippi. Uh, that maroon area we refer to here in Mississippi as the Delta. Um, probably everyone who's listening in would recognize this as the eastern portion of the lower Mississippi alluvial valley, so it's part of the, the river floodplain. Um, it's, an, it's the floodplain itself uh, once harbored extensive wetland forests. A lot of that, most of that has been converted from forest into some type of agricultural land cover and land use, but in the last couple of decades there have been a, a reasonable amount of that that actually has been uh, converted back into various types of conservation lands, including WRP wetlands. Uh, within this landscape, uh, there's pretty intense agriculture that, that takes place. Uh, I have three maps up here showing the percent of each of these hydrologic units within the, the Mississippi Delta that um, in, in the year from which I obtained these data, I think it was maybe 2012, uh, that the percent of each of these that was uh, in uh, corn, cotton, or soybean row crop agriculture. Um, and then you can see the, the mean, the minimum per, in the, the table below, it's the minimum uh, percentage per hydrologic unit. So, you know, some of these had none of, of any of these crops. Um, some of them have as much as 50% cover of the, the, that watershed in um, soybean, for example. If we look instead of at crops, but at rest, restored wetlands, uh, we see a little bit different picture where on average about 4% of these hydrologic units or these watersheds is uh, in restored wetland land cover, um, again with a minimum of zero and a maximum of about 27% in a few of these, um, these watersheds. Uh, and then if you look spatially at the relationships, typically we see a higher percentage of restored wetlands where there's a lower um, intensity of agriculture within the system. 
And uh, again, we were interested in these wetlands, these restored wetlands within this agricultural landscape and, and trying to determine um, the, the wetland functionality or wetland services that may be uh, provided by these. Uh, on this slide, on the left side, what I've done is taken the, the aerial cover of each watershed within each of these crops, um, so the, the, the hectare um, within each watershed, and then I pulled from the National Agricultural Statistics Service the um, sort of the average amount of nitrogen fertilizer that was used per hectare for each of these crops and developed a, uh, a three category classification of the uh, kilograms nitrogen per hectare that one might expect to have been applied within these watersheds. And we just divided those into three categories, a low, a medium, and a high nitrogen loading category. And that's going to become more important in just a minute as uh, Corey talks about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, but essentially what I've done in that map on the left is I, I've uh, broken the Mississippi Delta into these three nitrogen loading categories. Um, in developing this project, we, we sort of thought about how much time we have in order to, to get out and collect data, uh, to drive around the Delta and visit all these wetlands. And so we decided to look at, uh, and, and the, the availability of both nat natural or non-managed and wetland reserve wetlands. And uh, we developed a list of, um, well, a list of all of the reserve sites. And from that, we randomly pulled eventually a set of 30 wetlands. So we have 24 WRP wetlands and six non-managed wetlands within the landscape. And then we uh, stratified those uh, across these nitrogen loading categories. Um, so we had 10 wetlands in the high, 10 wetlands in the medium, and 10 wetlands in the low nitrogen loading category um, with eight of the restored wetlands within each of those categories and separated among the watersheds within each of these, uh, these nitrogen categories. Um, at each one of these study sites, um, Corey and uh, a former graduate student, Evelyn DiOrio, they visited these sites and they collected data on the plants, on water quality, they collected soil samples. Uh, Corey uh, collected through GIS data on land cover surrounding each of these, as well as some other things um, for us to, to look at these relationships. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let Corey talk to you for a little bit about the, the work that he did and some of the results that he's found so far. Corey? All right. Thanks, Dr. Irvin. Uh, so in going through my research, uh, when we're visiting these wetlands, we conducted uh, surveys of these wetlands in May and August of 2014 and 2015. And we visited each of the wetlands twice uh, during each growing season to hopefully capture both the early and the late season plants in these uh, systems. And then we uh, attempted to systematically sample a subset of each wetland uh, by placing 50 circular sampling plots in a grid of transects across the wetland and measured percent cover by species. And we, following this over our two growing seasons, we observed over uh, 300 different species of plants. And uh, to give you a little idea of what we saw out there, when we first went out, we uh, expected to see mostly seed-bearing graminoid annuals as this is what most of our landowners were managing for. They're trying to really create those uh, habitats that are really suitable for waterfowl foraging. That's what a lot of these uh, WRPs are, are, or our restored wetlands were used for. And uh, we actually saw, contrary to what we believe, we saw about half of our observed plant species were forbs, as you can see in that upper left uh, pie chart, and about two thirds of our plant species were perennials, which was surprising to us. But if you're looking at the uh, wet status of plants encountered, we did see that the vast majority of these plants were hydrophytes, with about 80% of the plant species observed falling into the facultative, facultative wetland or obligate wetland categories. So it seems to us that these systems have developed hydrophytic vegetation characteristic of wetlands. And, uh, but specifically looking at the difference between our restored and our non-managed wetlands, how, we were wondering how do the plant assemblages differ between these two systems. So looking at these two different systems, uh, different metrics of richness, evenness, diversity, and coefficient of conservatism, uh, we saw that in terms of richness, evenness, and diversity, and this is Shannon Weaver diversity, uh, that these metrics were greater in our restored wetlands than compared to our non-managed wetlands. However, the plant quality, which is we base that off of coefficient of conservatism, 
is greater than our non-managed wetland. And this is interesting to us because it, from a plant perspective, it seems as though we need to treat our restored and our non-managed wetlands differently because their uh, plant assemblages seem to be characterized and develop in a different type of manner. So when we're looking at this, restored sites have a higher diversity than natural sites. They have greater evenness, and they also have a, a greater richness. So that's good, right? Well, if you're from the United States, you might know that the start of the college football season is approaching right now. And as the uh, great uh, analyst Lee Corso would say, not so fast, my friend. There could be other things potentially driving these patterns. And when looking at this question, we see, yeah, our uh, our restored and our non-managed sites are different based on the plant assemblages that we see there, but what could in fact be driving these patterns? And we think that it's based off of three main things, historical land conversion, management, and the hydro period. So what we mean by historical land conversion is that in the Delta, this is an area of incredibly fertile soil. Most of it is converted to agriculture, and only those areas that were extremely wet and not able to be converted to agriculture were left as wetlands that weren't managed. So that potentially when we're looking at our wetlands on the landscape, the only wetlands that were left were those that were more palustrine in nature compared to ephemeral wetlands. This could also be due to management. And uh, this is a central role in our wetlands, especially for diversity even and evenness. If you think of the uh, competitive exclusion principle back to Connell from the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, and also, this is important for our plant co coefficient of conservatism, which is based on the uh, frequency of occurrence of these plants and their uh, propensity to disturbance. And as you know, if you manage a wetland, you, in general, disturb it. And our land owners do this through disking, burning, herbicide, etc. So management could, in fact, be driving these patterns of plants that we see on the landscape. And then finally, the linchpin of anything uh, to do with wetlands is hydrology. And this is uh, based on the hydro period or the fingerprint of the wetland. And what we see here as an example, uh, uh, these are two different hydrographs. The one on the top is a non-managed wetland. The one on the bottom is a reference, uh, I'm sorry, a restored wetland. On our y-axis, you can see water depth. And on the x-axis is time of year. And as you can see, our Restored wetlands are, in general, they have a shorter hydro period, and they are inundated to a lesser degree than our non-managed wetlands. And what's even more interesting about these two sites is they're actually separated by about 200 meters. So they're in close proximity to one another, but they show vastly different hydro periods. Now, looking at our wetlands as a whole on the landscape, we see that this trend continues. So again, on our y-axis, you see the median water depth over all of our non-managed wetlands and all of our WRP wetlands, or, or our restored wetlands. And the date is along the x-axis. And what you can see, again, reflected here is that our restored wetlands, in general, have less water on them for a shorter amount of time. So this really can affect the uh, plant, uh, plants that can live in these sites. So we see that managed wetlands, because of potentially because of the reduced length of flooded periods, have, high, have a higher species diversity. And that these systems are hydrologically different, which thus impacts the plant species present. So we know that the non-managed wetlands in our WRP sites are different from a hydrological, hydrologic perspective, but what about their placement on the landscape? So how do these wetlands differ potentially on what's surrounding them? So as we know from the movie Finding Nemo, all drains lead to the ocean. Well, on a landscape, all water drains to the lowest point, and this is oftentimes wetlands. So we know that we can't view these systems in isolation from the land around them. So if we see a wetland, we have to look at what's potentially happening around the wetland to see how that influences the patterns of uh, interest within the wetland. And you can look at this from multiple different uh, spatial scales as you go out. And intuitively, we know that the differences in land use and land cover will affect plant assemblages in these systems. And in the delta, this holds true as well. And uh, 
we looked at four different types of land use and land cover prevalent in the Delta region, and I want to highlight the effects of just one of them, uh, the fallow and conservation land on assemblage diversity. And what we see is that with fallow and conservation land, that increases in the amount of this type of land cover and land use around the wetlands has a strong effect on plant diversity and a positive effect. So the more uh, conservation land you have around these wetlands, the uh, more diverse of a site you get in terms of the plant assemblage that's present. And we see that this is also uh, correlated with distance, where up to uh, 500 meters outside of the wetland, we see this trend continue. So when we compare WRP to non-managed wetlands in the delta, we see that these systems are placed at different locations on the landscape. So if you look, these are on the y-axis of each of these, these are hectares of a particular land use or land cover with agriculture on the top left, conservation land on the bottom left, and then woody wetlands on the right center. And what we see is that our WRP, or our restored sites, are generally embedded in the matrix of conservation land and agriculture, while our non-managed wetlands are surrounded in general, built in general by more woodly, woody wetland cover. So what we're seeing on this landscape is that the nearby areas of land managed for soil or water conservation can lead to a higher wetland plant species diversity, as well as the fact that these wetlands uh, are different on the landscape. So our non-managed wetlands are surrounded by a different suite of land use and land cover compared to our restored wetlands. So we have to look at these systems in a, in a different light and individually. So moving on uh, and bringing this back to our introduction, we were wondering how might these differences in placement on the landscape affect the interaction of vegetation and water quality in these, in these systems. Specifically, do changes in water quality associated with different land use and land covers alter plant assemblage composition in these systems? And if you think about it on the flip side of the coin, how do these plant assemblages affect overall water quality? And we went about this doing an experimental study uh, at, in mesocosms at an agricultural facility here on Mississippi State University's campus, specifically looking at how uh, common wetland stressors affect plant assemblages, and then the uh, converse of that, how plant assemblages uh, affect these contaminants. Specifically, we're looking at nitrogen and sediment, as these are major stressors to our wetlands in the Delta region. And we did this by looking at and constructing 75 mesocosms and following them across true, two growing seasons. And we dosed these mesocosms with four combination treatments of nitrogen and sediment. And these uh, uh, nitrogen and sediment treatments uh, were constructed to mirror levels observed in the delta because we're, because we're trying to simulate as closely as possible the conditions in these wetlands. And to that end, as well, the mesocosm hydro periods were managed to resemble restored wetlands in the delta. So we're really trying to uh, control this and make it as realistic as possible as you can within a 100-gallon mesocosm. So this, this is a different way of looking at it. We collected soil from three delta wetlands and grew up these uh, assemblages from the seed bank and treated them with four different levels of nitrogen and sediment in a randomized complete block design with high nitrogen, high sediment, all the way down to low nitrogen and low sediment, and of course with 15 controls. And uh, we surveyed these mesocosms monthly during the growth, growing season. And here in Mississippi, we tend to think of the growing season as between March and October. And, uh, record, and we recorded the uh, percent cover by species. So right now I'm going to present two different studies that took place in the mesocosms. And the first looked at water quality dynamics in these systems after the applications of treatments in July and September of 2015. So this is in the first year of this study because this ran from 2015 to 2016. And the second study that I'll present will focus on how these plant assemblages in turn responded to the various treatments. So what we see first is that a subset of these wetlands that we analyzed, we see that uh, a unique assemblages develop based on the wetland soil site of origin. Uh, and they, these assemblages are highly dependent on these, uh, where they came from in both July and September. And we see that the loss rate uh, of our stressors of interest, these are sediment, phosphate, ammonium, and nitrate, 
are generally similar between the July and September sampling. So you see our loss rate in milligrams per day on the y-axis, and on the x-axis you have our different variables of interest, with the shaded uh, box and whisker being July and the open one in September. So there, for most of the things that we analyzed, our loss rates were very similar between July and September. However, when looking at the capacity for uh, nutrient removal in, in these systems and the stress removal in these systems, we see that generally, uh, as nitrogen and sediment treatment levels are increased over the controls, these systems are able to remove these contaminants from the system. And this trend is especially evident in September, where you see higher relative loss rates of, uh, of our uh, increased stressors compared to the controls in both July and September, but especially in September. And so finally, the difference between plant species among wetlands was ac accompanied by differences in floristic quality of species in July. And interestingly enough, we see that in September, the combination of a high sediment and high nitrogen treatments resulted in the lowest FQAI, or this is a, a measure of plant quality among the five different treatments. So while the non-treatment uh, systems can remove elevated levels of stressors over a short period of time, over a few months actually, we see these stressor levels result in lower quality of plant assemblages. Also, we found that higher quality plant assemblages, and this is assessed through FQAI, seem to have a higher capacity for nutrient removal. And this was in fact not correlated to percent cover. So it seems that the quality of the plants and not the quantity may impact nutrient and sediment removal in these systems. And this is at least over the time period that we investigated. So another uh, major take home from this uh, study was that systems that are not managed for water quality specifically can actually serve to improve water quality. These uh, WRP and our restored sites are managed extensively for waterfowl, but we see that they also have a high capacity for nutrient removal as well. So just another added benefit of putting these wetlands on the landscape. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but still it's uh, nice to have that uh, that extra to, to sell landowners with. So this bring me, brings me to my next portion of the mesocosm study. Uh, and we're, in this portion, we're experimentally testing to see how differences in water quality uh, impact plant assemblage dynamics. And this is done in the same system and the same treatments as the previous study, but we followed these systems over a two-year period. So the growing seasons of both 2015 and 2016, and again, we developed these and we grew them up from the seed bank and followed them by measuring percent cover over time. So what we did was we wanted to look to see if we have a certain assembly, a certain group of plant assemblages represented here by the gray dots. If we dose them with a certain treatment, would they all develop similarly and have an assemblage convergence based on treatment? So are we seeing deterministic processes occur in these systems? or if we dose them with the treatment, do we see differences or no assemblage convergence based on treatment or stochastic processes happening in these systems? So like I said, we followed these over a two-year period and condensed it down into this one figure here. So what you can see, uh, there are four figures here. What you need to pay attention to is this heavy line above the heavy line. This is a NMDS, or an ordination, breaking our mesocosms apart by soil site of origin. Below that, it's breaking our mesocosms apart by treatment. And what you just need to pay attention to is the colors. On the top, each dot represents a mesocosm assemblage over the entirety of our study. And the color indicates a different wetland of origin that we pulled it from. And what you can see, hopefully, is that in September of 2015 and September of 2016, we see strong clustering based on soil site of origin. Conversely, when we look at treatment, we see no clustering evident based on our uh, various treatments. So this suggests that these systems develop in a stochastic manner, and they're independent of treatment. However, when we started examining assemblage metrics associated with the different treatments, we see that high levels of nitrogen, so uh, you see richness on your y-axis and our treatments on the x-axis, control, then H stands for high, N is nitrogen, 
and S stands for sediment, we see that high levels of nitrogen decrease species richness in mesocosms over the study period, both in 2014 and then again in 2015, and that any increases in nitrogen and sediment levels over the control uh, resulted in decreases in diversity. So high levels of nitrogen and uh, over our treatment, we see a converse and a, a decrease in diversity over time. So finally, we're interested in what processes drive plant assemblages, dyna plant assemblage dynamics in these systems, particularly whether environmental filtering or competition played a larger role in the observed plant assemblages. And to do this, we compared phylogenetic patterns, specifically looking to see if, if the assemblages developed a clustered configuration or an overdispersed configuration. And just to give you a little rundown on what these uh, mean, a clustered phylogenetic pattern suggests that environmental filtering is a chief process affecting the, this pattern. And this assumes niche conservatism or high phylogenetic signal, basically saying that related species are ecologically similar, similar and interact with their environment in similar ways. So if you have a certain amount of stressors, only species that are closer, closely related are able to survive. So thus, if you picture a phylogenetic tree all laid out, those species that are able to live in the system will be clustered in certain spots on that tree. Conversely, phylogenetic overdispersal can arise from two different processes. One, uh, lim lim limiting similarity by conver uh, convergent traits, basically competition, or filtering combined with convergent traits. So basically, this is saying distant, that distantly related species independently evolve traits to survive the condition. So if we're looking at our tree, you can see that this would be an example of a clustered pattern, whereas an overdispersed or a pattern that potentially is caused by competition would look something like this. And to do this and to assess what may potentially be driving these assemblages in these systems, we constructed a phylogenetic tree based on three plastid markers and uh, calculated the relatedness of our assemblage via the near, nearest taxon index, or NTI, and compared our observed observations over the entire study period, so this is over the two-year study period, to the null models, the null models that we developed. And what we see, I can draw your attention to this graph, is on our y-axis we have our average NTI values, and the closer that you get to uh, negative one, this indicates a more clustered pattern or environmental filtering, where, whereas values closer to positive one indicate phylogenetic overdispersion. overdispersion. And on our x-axis, it's broken apart by treatment and year. So you can see control 2015, that's our control mesocosm from 2015, versus our control mesocosm from 2016. So what we see is that in general, over time, the systems tend to become more clustered, indicating that these systems are structured more through environmental filtering processes. And, and in addition, compared to our control uh, treatments, increases in nitro nitrogen and sediment loads resulted in more cl strongly clustered assemblages compared to our controls both in 2015 and 2016. And this pattern holds true uh, for most of our treatments. So what we see from this, the take home message is that Assemblages are strongly structured by our soil source, and that increases, increased nitrogen loads result in decreased assemblage diversity and richness, and early succession wetland plant assemblages may in fact be structured through competition, but over time we see that these, uh, that potentially more uh, environmental filtering processes could influence the assemblage dynamics in these systems. And then finally, environmental filtering patterns associated with increases in nitrogen and sediment over our control levels could be impacting these systems as well. So what we see tying these, this whole last mesocosm section together is that plant species are strongly influenced by individual wetland identity, but plant assemblages show the ability to remove nutrients and sediment. So we see that our plants are affected by our stressors and they in turn impact these stressors, and that the soil source is strongly determines our assemblage identity, but the addition of these stressors can alter the richness and diversity of these systems.
In addition, we also see that these systems may be uh, dispersal limited, and uh, hopefully in the future we can analyze some more data to look at that and really try to keep that out a little bit better. And then finally, plant assemblage dynamics may be driven by environmental filtering mechanisms. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Urban to uh, work over the overall conclusions to the work that we've been doing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Corey. All right, so now I get to pretend like I know what's going on with this. Um, again, some more of uh, what Corey was just describing. Um, so, so what can we kind of take away from this in, in the context of the way I set up the, the presentation, which is we're going to have more people, all of whom are hungry, uh, want to eat food, and, um, and in parts of the world, we have, may have difficulty providing that food without some intensification of agriculture. Um, or, of course, we also have the, the distribution of food issue, which is a separate thing, but related to wetlands and water quality, it's this uh, agricultural intensification problem. And so if we look at, you know, we have a, a piece of the landscape that Corey was working in over there in this slide, um, where we have this uh, diverse hydrology, even in the, the Mississippi Delta, in this alluvial valley, which is extremely flat, we still have some diversity in hydrology. Uh, there's some, some topography over there. We have different types of, of wetlands, depressions, streams, et cetera, within that landscape. So we have this diverse hydrology, and we also have in, in various areas different types of uh, fallow land or conservation easements within this landscape, kind of interspersed among different types of, of uh, hydrologic features on the landscape. And all of this has the potential to provide a diversity of wetland plants that, as, as we've just seen, and of course we all know, have the uh, capacity to modify water quality. And, and hope we would hope that what we're doing is sort of designing a landscape that can actually improve the quality of waters that are uh, running off. Um, and of course, there are always are opportunities with the amount of, of agricultural that, agriculture that takes place uh, to incorporate additional wetlands, um, or as is happening in a number of uh, on a number of farms within the Delta, um, both in Mississippi and Arkansas that I'm aware of, uh, the addition of uh, above ground water storage facilities uh, that that are used to actually, in, in some cases, recirculate water and, and help remove additional nutrients. So we could uh, incorporate additional wetlands in here and uh, take hopefully some of the information that. Uh, it's coming out of Corey's work and the work being done by other people to um, help to design these systems and not just the wetlands themselves, but the placement of these wetlands within a landscape that could best facilitate improvement of water quality and mitigate some of these, uh, the potential negative impacts that are leading to uh, eutrophication. And that is the end of our talk. We have uh, acknowledgments here of some people who have uh, contributed significantly to this work. Um, including especially at the bottom of the list, the landowners who provided uh, invaluable access to their land for two or three years for Corey and Evelyn to, to go out and collect data. And we hope that you've all found this interesting and maybe there's some good questions out there. This is your moderator, Roy Massaros, wanting to thank you both, Corey and Gary, for doing a great job and making my job easy as moderator because you stayed very much on schedule. Your talk went for 45 minutes, and we have time now for questions. Great. And the way this will the way this will work is I'll see questions and I'll read the questions to you both, and then you'd have time to answer them. I believe there might have been a question or two that came in that you can uh, start with. Um, Am I correct in that assumption? Yeah, yeah. We actually um, saw one earlier from uh, Allie. Uh, I had a question about. Corey's, I guess Corey's mesoplasm study in the ordination. Um, wondered, Corey, did you run any ordination uh, within individual wetland sites to see if the treatments appear to be shifting species there? All right, so looking at our, uh, uh, specifically looking within our wetland site, uh, we haven't got to that yet as uh, I guess any scientific project that you've taken part in, you know there's a lot more data that can always be analyzed, and that's uh, what we're looking to do in the future, more specifically looking down and breaking out down these uh, wetland sites, specifically looking at the uh, plant species 
on the landscape and moving from what we did in our mesocosms to applying that to the landscape to really start to dig into the ecological questions that could be driving these plant assemblages on the landscape. So we haven't done it quite yet, but it's definitely on the horizon once, uh, once some time rolls into my lap. Thank you, Alex. Uh, this is Roy, your moderator, with just a general question, because I'm curious if we want to have a PDF of your talk, we'll be able to download that from the SWS website, the PDF version of your slides today. I think we, we certainly can provide that. Um, I think Tony had talked about making that available, but, but definitely um, we can send a PDF so that that's available. For sure. I, this I, is I Tony. I, I, um, if, if you look on the handout section of the go to meeting or go to webinar control panel, you should be able to download those right from the webinar control panel. But yes, they will also be available. So, so Tony, they're right. currently they're currently available in that fashion. Uh, I think I see what you're talking about. Yes, handouts. Okay. Looks like a bunch of questions. Um, there are a bunch of questions popping up, but I, my menu, I can't adjust the width of it. So um, I don't know if, if Roy, can you? I, I can. This is Roy. I can adjust it, but right now I'm experiencing some. Oh, here we go. So um, there's one here. And maybe, on. maybe Tony, you can explain why I, I have a wide screen, but I'm not seeing questions that Gary and Corey may be referring to. No problem. I'll just I I go, I can I'll read these here. Uh, Kathleen uh, says, uh, "What is the soil? What are the soil differences, parent material, or classification?" Not sure what she's referring to, but maybe that makes sense to you. Yeah. So uh, in the delta, I guess it's a largely homogeneous region in terms of the soil that we're seeing out there, since it's a, a lar it's largely alluvial, alluvial because it is a former floodplain of the Mississippi River. Uh, in terms of our soil series, it's mostly heavy clay, uh, alligator, sharky, and dundee series are the most common ones that we uh, saw out there. So a lot of heavy clays in these, this region, and it's mostly consistent throughout the, uh, throughout the study area. And, but those are the three main series that we saw in the areas where we collected soil and did our surveying from was the uh, sharky, uh, dundee, and forestdale or forest series. I can't remember the exact name, but definitely those three. And, and I was able to figure out how to undock the questions, so I can I can actually see them now. Um, so the second question is from Kimberly, who asks, when considering the effect of maturity on the plant species assemblages, how long would you suggest monitoring a WRP wetland after restoration? Yes. Dr. Corey. <laughs> So that's an interesting point. Uh, with our WRPs and our restored wetlands, if you're not familiar with them here, most of them are managed pretty extensively, again, to create that, uh, that hopefully, that, that suite of seed-bearing annuals. So they need to be uh, burned, disked, diked, uh, levied up, and then uh, managed fairly frequently. Uh, usually they're managed within two to three years which is why we ran our mesocosm study over two years. One, because I wanted to graduate eventually, and two, uh, because that's very similar to what uh, they experienced in, in the Delta. And I forget, we didn't mention in our uh, presentation, but all of our wetlands that we looked at in the Delta were greater than 10 years post-restoration. So we're looking at uh, wetlands that have been on the landscape for a while compared to some, to some uh, restoration wetlands. So I guess that would really depend on the, the system that you're looking at, I mean. Uh, in the WRPs, you can look at them up to two years post-restoration, and that'll be very similar to what you'll see, hopefully, throughout the, the lifespan of these, especially if the landowners are managing them, managing them intensively for uh, waterfowl production. I mean, these, these wetlands, you're able to uh, cultivate parts of them as well. So I guess that to answer your question, it really depends on the system that you're looking at. Uh, I know a lot of research has been done with the early parts of restorations, especially seeing uh, are your mitigation wetlands really reaching those targets that you set for them, but not as much has been done over the long term. And uh, it'd be really interesting to see if you, you follow and you don't manage these wetlands, what will they end up turning into over time? Um, next question is from 
Sandy, who asked about organic matter in the soil. So th these were around one to one and a half percent. I think I think our organic matter in our wetlands uh, it was dependent on the the non-managed and our uh, managed wetlands. So our restored wetlands were different than our non-managed wetlands. Our non-managed wetlands were around three percent, if I can. It's in the ballpark three percent plus or minus a little bit. And then I think you were right. I yeah. think our one and a half to maybe two percent for our, yeah. our, our restored wetlands. And again, you know, this is most likely down to that that driving force of hydrology with yeah. our non-managed wetlands really being inundated a lot longer, which allows for the uh, accumulation of that organic material in the, in the soil. But we're seeing, uh, and compared to the uh, the agricultural lands in the region, our restored wetlands are kind of an intermediary between the agricultural lands, even rice fields in the delta, and uh, the the non-managed wetlands as well. So, yeah, and I've seen recently at a at a conference, an in-state conference, in some no-till no farming in the um, the MAV, where after a couple of years, I think they were in the neighborhood of maybe a half percent, um, between a half and one percent organic matter, and then our managed sites are a little bit more than that. Um, they, they, when they, when the soil is disturbed, it's not typically as uh, intense as we would see in a, a cultivated system. Um, the next question is uh, from Jennifer, who asks about soil structure, um, and that you didn't, you didn't really look at. No, we structure. didn't really look at the soil structure, but uh, like I said, most of these have been. Uh, been in, they've all been in restoration for at least 10 years, but of course the legacy of cultivation can last for decades, if not centuries. So we didn't uh, specifically analyze soil structure, but that would be an interesting way to go to go from there to see specifically how that might be affecting the plant assemblages that we see. In addition, potentially looking at uh, uh, the suite of microbes associated as well with these restored versus non-managed wetlands. So this is Roy Massaro, your moderator. I can now have access to questions. So I believe the next question after Jennifer's was from Luca. Yes, he sir. complimented the great talk. Might or if fish species diversity higher in the non-restored wetter areas in your sites slash photos, how do you overall judge the wetland restoration outcome? Example by a synthetic indicator. All right, so I guess the, the first uh, thing about the fish species diversity, uh, I, I'm not a fish biologist and I didn't really look at the fish all that much, but I definitely know that if uh, you look back at our, the hydrographs are of our non-managed, of our restored wetlands in general, in general, they go completely dry during the summer months. And this is to allow the landowner to do some management on them or uh, really promote those uh, seed producing annuals, those mudflat species. So we really don't see uh, large fish communities developing in our restored wetlands just because there's not a lot of water there throughout the growing season, which obviously prevents fish from living there. And then in terms of uh, judging the outcome of restorations, uh, that's, again, <laughs> this is my own philosophical bent on this, but it's based off of what you as a landowner want. And working on these private lands in particular, that drove that home to me is what's, uh, what indicates a successful restoration for one landowner may be different than another. I had some landowners who were just fine to let it go and develop a beautiful suite of plants. They just wanted something nice to go out and look at. Others were developing and managing this land to attract hunting easements so they could make an extra income off that land. So really, in my opinion, it's based off of what goals you or your stakeholder has for the land. Uh, we can set different goals that we want, you know, this diversity of plant species, but we know that diversity is not an infallible uh, target to try to hit. You know, you can have a high diversity, but it'd be chock full of invasives. You could have a high, uh, say, quality of plants, but if that doesn't allow you to reach what goals you want, such as uh, attracting ducks for your children to see, it's not going to uh, really do it for you. So it's really, uh, from a private land perspective, it's really based off of what your landowners want. And I hope that we showed that, you know, we need to view these systems are restored in our non-managed wetlands. We need to view them through different lenses. 
and that we also need to realize that we, even though we might be managing for one thing, we get a plethora of other benefits when these wetlands are placed on the landscape. So even though we may be managing for uh, uh, water quality, we can still attract waterfowl. Even though we uh, are looking at these these sites, we can really develop some in interesting and beneficial, unexpectedly beneficial uh, outcomes from these restorations. So I, I hope that kind of answers what you're asking. Dr. Irvin, do you have anything to add? I think, I think the only thing I would, would add to that would be, um, in, in particular, the last portion of the question, um, would, would we or I um, want to use a synthetic indicator to evaluate success? And, and I think, personally, I think I would not do that. Um, you know, we do, we use the, the forest equality assessment index, but we also use the raw metrics there. You saw in some of the data, the coefficients of conservatism. Um, I think what I would do if I were trying to, to take this, this set of 30 wetlands and um, determine which ones were, quote, successful, I think I would, I would come up with a list of some small number of uh, functions that I wanted to see out of these. Um, they would probably be things like provision of waterfowl habitat, um, desirable nutrient concentrations, and some other water quality parameters. And I would probably look at each of those individually and maybe rank each wetland based on each of those and say, okay, what were the top third or, or you know, 30 percent, 25 percent of these wetlands in terms of multiple of those individual functions rather than trying to somehow combine those into an index. Um, I, I, I tend to prefer to keep as much information as possible rather than sort of distilling it down into an, an individual metric. So that's a, the, I appreciate that question. That was, that's a really good a, a question and helpful in terms of us sort of yeah, thinking yeah. about what, what is it we're doing and why. Yeah. Roy? We, we have time for one more question. I see a question from Diane that asks, could you go over the species in the assemblages? She may have missed that because of internet problems. If you were, if you had already talked about that, yeah, and Corey did, um, and that was relatively early in the talk. Slide he, he talked a little bit about um, what he found. Yeah, so we had uh, in this, the assemblages that we're looking at in the in the delta, we had about 300 different species that we saw. The vast majority of them, about two thirds, were perennial, which was a little bit different than what we expected. We expected to see a lot more annuals. We also expected to see a greater per proportion of graminoids. We saw about 30% uh, graminoid and about half were uh, forbs or herbs. So in terms of growth forms, that's what we were seeing. Uh, to give you an idea of some plants that we're seeing out there, we, of course we saw a lot of uh, carex species, cyparis, all sorts of juncus in terms of our graminoids. Those were our major ones. Some fimbrostylus here or there. Uh, probably the most common species that we saw in the delta was a Brunichia ovata, uh, Campsis radicans. Those vines just tend to take over. Uh, in general, not a lot of uh, uh, invasive species. We saw a couple here or there, but again, that the hydro period really prevents the establishment of some of those really noxious uh, obligate uh, uh, species such as water hyacinth. Uh, in terms of the wet status of the plants we encountered, about two, uh, about 80% of them were actually within facultative fact wet or obligate. So we're developing on these sites uh, some really robust uh, hydrophytic vegetation there. Uh, in our uh, in our non-managed sites, uh, a lot of the species that we saw that I encountered frequently: Nolumbolydia, uh, Zizaniopsis milicea, uh some naiads as well, especially in the sites that stayed inundated a bit longer. So, and of course, the uh, ever-present typha in certain wetlands and uh, the bane of all wetland scientists, Learzia, or cut grass mm -hmm. in, in some of these systems. So we had a, quite a diverse uh, suite of species, Iliochorus as well. And then in our, uh, in our mesocosms, we saw I'd, somewhere right around 190 to 100 species that we saw occurring in the mesocosms as well over that two-year study period. And by far, uh, the most common one that we saw there was Iliochorus obtusa, the spike rush. But by the end, we started to develop more and more perennial species. We got some uh, Juncus acutius stands growing up and flowering in these systems, and some really nice Cyparis stands as well. So quite, quite the gambit. We've even got some uh, macrophytic algae with the, uh, the Cara out there as well. So uh, uh, quite a diversity of plants in terms of the uh, 
the, the species that we saw present in the, the different growth forms that we saw. Everything from all of Skullthorpe's four different uh, growth forms were, were present in all of these, in these in the two studies. No. Okay, great. It's exactly two o'clock, so we're precisely on schedule. Therefore, you've made my life easy to do as a moderator. So in summation, if there's no other questions or any other comments from our speakers, I'll pause if there are any additional thoughts you want to make right now before I bring us to conclusion. Was there anything else you wanted to mention, Gary or Corey? I'm, I'm just uh, really grateful for this opportunity. This is a great way to, um, you know, to give a talk to the membership without leaving our office. And, Definitely. Know, share some of the work we've been doing. And we got some really nice questions, and, and I appreciate the attendance by everyone and, and the moderator, and then also Tony for all the, you know, keeping us straight on all the tech support. It took a team effort, and I think we all worked very, very well this afternoon. So I'd like to thank Gary and Corey again for their time and their outstanding presentation and staying on schedule. Thank you for that. As a reminder, and I'd like to thank everybody that called in today, and for that matter, everybody that's involved with wetlands, because earlier our presenters made the fact, the point about what's going on in our world and 9 billion people in the not-too-distant future. Wetlands are such a critical part of our survival, so I want to acknowledge everybody's interest and efforts in our SWS quest for a better planet to live in. As a reminder, September 20th at 1 p.m. is the next webinar that's scheduled Practical Advice for Management and Continuous Improvement in Wetland Restoration. So there, yeah, there's a slide right now that is a reminder for the September 20th webinar. And so again, thank you everyone for your, your valuable time. It's appreciated. And Tony, the Orchestrator, I don't know if you do anything else to close this out or we just conclude and wrap it up at this point. Is there anything else that you need to add, Tony? Just wanted to bring up that final slide. I know in your um, the uh, there wasn't a slide in the beginning, so maybe I just want to bring one more uh, piece of attention to the Wetland Ambassadors uh, Fellowship here as well. As we close I, I had looked for those slides that weren't in the beginning. I knew they were someplace in the slide deck, so thank you for bringing this donation slide up again for the goal of two thousand dollars and if tony doesn't have any other comments or conclusion thank you everyone again for your time today and have a good afternoon thanks bye-bye thank you, thank you.